Well, we're very glad to have Zichuan Zhuang from MIT, who's going to tell us about properness of the K-module aspects. All right, um, thanks for the invitation and thanks to Ravi for the introduction. So, right, so my title is already on the, on the screen. So I'm going to talk about um, this K properties of the K-module space. And this is joined with, with uh, Yu Chen Liu, who's at Northwestern and Chiang Xu at Princeton. Um, so, so let me start by saying that, um, so everything I'm going to talk about is over the field of complex numbers or any um, algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. So, um, so the main question I want to consider in this talk is the following, namely put it vaguely, so is there, is there a nice modularized space for final varieties? So let me put down the question first, um, a nice modularized space of um, final varieties. And by final, of course we mean, um, so the anti-canonical divisor is Q Cartier and M So that's the final condition. And so as an algebraic geometer being nice um, for the moduli, Uri fluffs means that it should be separated and proper. And if you want a little bit more, you might want it to be even projective. Okay, so that's the question. Now, um, it's pretty well understood that if we try to include every final varieties in this modular space, it's going to be very badly behaved. And the main issue is that um, there are many isotrivial degenerations of final varieties. So meaning that I can write down a family of final varieties over a curve. Let's say the curve is called C and there's a distinguished point zero such that, um, so this is a family of final varieties. And the problem is that um, you can have families where um, away from this close point away from the central fiber, all the fibers are isomorphic to some fixed final variety. However, on the central fiber, what you get is something different. So this means that um, on the moduli space, um, if that exists, then the moduli point for X um, will contain the moduli point of X zero in the closure. And because those are two different points, this implicitly says that the moduli space is not separated. And there are many examples of this. Um, so for instance, you can just take P2 and um, use the usual degeneration to the normal cone construction and degenerate it to um, the cone over the conic. So this cone over conic is the X zero. Um, and notice that this is, so as, the variety, this is the weighted projective plane P114. So it only has quotient singularity, if you want. So singularity is not really the problem. Um, and actually the situation here is even worse. So there are many other degeneration, isotrivial degenerations of P2. So it can also degenerate to, um, further degenerate to this, some other weighted projective planes. Um, so A squared, B squared, C squared, um, where, um, the ABC satisfy this Markov type equation. So, so this equation basically ensures that the, um, the volume stay the same in the degeneration. And this are um, started by Manati, who showed that basically all this um, projective planes smooths out to P2. So that gives you a lot of isotrivial degenerations of P2 to something that's mildly singular. So in some sense, the situation here um, is a little bit like the moduli space of um, vector bundles. So, um, so if you put all the final varieties in the stack, uh, so this moduli stack of final varieties um, is in some sense um, similar to the moduli stack of all vector bundles, say vector bundles over curve, in the sense that um, it's highly non-separated. And it's sometimes even hard to find a close point. Just these degenerations, you can, you, know, you can keep this degeneration going on. So um, on the other hand, if we are supposed to construct a nice model space, 
then the lesson we learned from the moduli of vector bundle is that we need to impose a stability condition. So, so we need a stability condition. So in the case of funnel varieties, the stability condition is called case stability. But um, originally, so I'm going to tell you, tell you more about this later on, but originally this stability condition um, come from differential geometry. So, um, so let me um, discuss that first. Um, so in differential geometry, um, people consider canonical metrics and in particular k Einstein metrics. So these are Kähler metrics whose Richard curvature is constant. Um, so in other words, the Richard ten curvature tensor is proportional to the metric tensor. And for final varieties, the curvature is positive. So that's the Einstein equation we get. All right, so, so this k Einstein metrics, they don't always exist, but once they exist, it's essentially unique up to automorphism. So that's some canonical structure you can impose on the variety. Now, um, there are two results from differential geometry that suggest to us that, um, that if, you, if you restrict to the set of final varieties, um, so with um, k line and metrics, then that particular modular space is supposed to be nice. Right, so, so let me tell you the results. So the first differential geometric result is that if, if we consider the set of final manifolds, that carries a Kähler Einstein matrix. So, so from now on, I'm going to abbreviate this as Ke for Kähler Einstein. Um, so, if we consider this particular set, um, then this has a natural matrix structure. So, it's actually a matrix space. It's a matrix space. And the reason is that um, there exists um, the so called Gromov Hausdorff distance. between any compact metric spaces. So let's just value the Gromov cost of distance between um, compact metric spaces. So if the final variety, final manifold has the k Einstein metric, then you use this canonical metric to turn it into a metric space, which is compact. But for any two such compact metric space, you can talk about the Gromov cost of distance, which, is, which can be defined on in general. So, so should we, should I, um, so the examples you mentioned above, you had singular things, which we can talk about more easily in the algebraic world, is the, mm -hmm. in the, uh, do all these things, should I not worry about singularities here? Like, do I, or, or so, do okay, yeah, that, that's a good question. So, um, so in general, this k Einstein metric can also be defined on, even on singular final varieties. Uh, but maybe I won't get into those technical details here, but they can be defined. Uh, on the other hand, for the differential geometry results that I'm going to mention, so usually you will have to restrict to the smooth case. But of course, in the end, we are going to generalize it to the singular case. Oh, sorry, but there's a, there's a different point, which is that, um, yeah, there are uh, isotribial families of, of smooth final varieties, uh, like, for example, certain projected bundles. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, maybe just to be clear what Bert said, right. So that there are isolated, wait, the separated problem, the lack of separatedness is probably already a problem in the manifold. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's already a problem even with smooth spaces, um, although it's no slightly harder to write down those examples than what I um, wrote here. All right, so, um, right, so, okay, so let, then let me continue. So the second um, result from differential, oh, so maybe let me first remark that, um, so why, why do I mention this first result? Um, so this is going to suggest us, because it's a metric space, um, this is suggest to us that um, this uh, moduli space of um, k lines and final varieties should be separated if that it's ever going to exist. Because metric spaces, they are hostile. Um, so now the second result from differential geometry is that, um, so this is due to Donaldson and Sun. 
So what I show is that um, if you choose any infinite sequence so of um, k lines and final manifolds, then um, up to possibly passing to a subsequence, you can always take the limit in this um, gromov hausdorff topology. Uh, and you would get a limit space. This limit space still has k lines symmetric. It's again a final variety. So in particular, it's algebraic, although you might lose the smoothness. So in general, it's only a variety which can be singular. But the key point here is that the K-Einstein condition is preserved under the limit con um, construction. So again, this is going to suggest us that if we take the moduli space of K-Einstein funnels varieties, um, then this should be proper because we can take the limit analytically in a suitable sense. All right, so. Um, so of course the existence of Kaline star matrix sounds like an analytic condition, but in fact it's the content of the so-called Yautian Donaldson conjecture. That um, for any final variety, the existence of a Kaline star matrix is actually an algebraic condition and it's equivalent to this, um, to saying that X is called polystable, K polystable. So um, I'm going to tell you what this stability means um, roughly later on. But for the moment, let's just keep in mind that the right hand side um, is an algebraic stability condition. So instead of talking about the modular space of K lines and final varieties, we're going to actually talk about um, modular space of polystable objects. So this motivates the so-called k moduli conjecture. That, um, so that there exists a proper, so separated and proper moduli space. Of um, k polystable um, final varieties. And in fact, it is further conjecture that all the connected components are projective. So it can have a lot of components, but they should all be projective. Okay, so, so that's the conjecture. Um, um, so of, of course, this conjecture has been worked on for many years recently, um, um, in the past decades, I guess. So there are a lot of progress. Um, so let me try to summarize um, the progress to give you a picture, like a rough picture of what this model like should look like. Um, uh, but maybe let me first ask, are there any questions uh, at this point? All right, so, uh, so now I need to do a little copy paste. Um, because there are just too many names to write down. Um, so, um, um, so this theorem has been worked on by so many people. Um, so um, to avoid the risk of forgetting any names, um, so I've um, copied these names in advance. Um, all right, so, so let me tell you the theorem. Um, so, um, so as usual, um, if we kind of want to construct a model space, we start with the, the semi-stable object first. To a stack in the modular space of vector bundles. So the first part of this theorem um, is going to tell us something about the modular stack of semi-stable objects. So let's first fix some numerical information. So n is going to stand for the dimension. That's an integer. And v um, is a positive rational number, which is going to um, be the volume of the final variety. So now we can consider the modular functor of semi-stable object. So, um, so this is here denoted by this. So um, upper script stands for K semi-stable, lower script uh, the numerical um, invariance. So this functor takes every scheme um, over C um, 
to the group point um, of a um, flat family of final varieties, uh, maybe flat family of k semi stable final varieties. Um, Unstable um, final varieties um, and with this numerical definition. So the dimension is n, and um, the any canonical volume, which is the top self intersection of minus k, and this should be v. Um, um, with an additional condition that this family should satisfy on um, the so called color condition. So I'm not going to really spell out what this color condition means. Um, it's not relevant to our discussion really, but uh, so for instance, um, if the base is like smooth, this condition simply means that um, the, the canonical divide of the total space is Q-Cartier. So we want all the, the anti-canonical line bundles on the fibers to glue together into a line bundle on the total space. That's the condition. Right, but it's going to be satisfied for most of the families we are going to consider. So let's don't worry about this. Right, so this is the modular stack of semi-stable objects. Um, so the conclusion of the first part of the theorem is that this modular functor is represented by an arting stack of finite type. Right, so this. So this is proven by a subset of these people. So I think by Jiang, um, Bloom, Liu, and Xu. So, um, so of course it's a more abstract statement, but more concretely, uh, what this says is that, so if you take a semi-stable final varieties of this dimension and volume, then they all embed into a, a certain projective space of fixed dimension. And then if you look at the Hilbert scheme um, of that projective space, then the local step parameterized k semi stable final varieties is a locally closed subset. Okay, so that's this adding stack of finite type, the concrete meaning of this sentence. And, and they're embedding in and they're embedding in projective space by just some multi, some pluricanonical. Yeah, by some pluricanonical. It's very canonical. Great. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so that's the first part of the theorem for the semi stable um, stack. Now, um, the second step in the construction of the modular space of the modular space is to pass to the S equivalence class and get the modular space of polystable objects, no matter what that means. Right, so, um, so then the second part of theorem says that, so now I take this stack of semi-stable objects, I'm going to drop the subscript. Um, so then this, um, so this has a, um, has a separated, good modular space. So again, I'm going to write down the abstract sentence and then I'm going to tell you what the concrete means. Uh, so as a separated good modular space, uh, which is going to be denoted by um, NK polystable, which, um, which is going to parameterize all um, K polystable final varieties. Final varieties. So again, um, so this is an abstract statement. So the concrete meaning is that um, so this um, this this semi-stable stack has a map um, to an algebraic space which I call NK polystable. So this is an algebraic space, and a tar locally on this algebraic space. Um, Um, this map looks like um, the map from a quotient stack, so a fine modular reductive um, mapping to the corresponding GIT quotient. So the spec of the ring of invariant. Oh, sorry. Uh, so that's the concrete meaning of this thing. Um, so for the good modular space. Part. And then furthermore, so this, this algebraic space is Created, and the points are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the k-modest k-polystable final varieties, and this this is what we call the k-modular space. 
so is there so there's a definition of k polystable which doesn't matter i mean there's some technical definition but is this going to be a moduli space in the is this going to represent the functor or just that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence it's just a one-to-one -one correspondence exactly. so the functor is mm -hmm. really the the semi-stable step great right yeah It's, a, it's roughly the same as like the moduli space of vector bundles. So there's a stack of semi-stable vector bundles up to a pass to S equivalence class to get the moduli space or like the cost space of um, vector, um, polystable vector bundles, something like that. Excellent. Same flavor. All right, so, so at least we get a separated moduli space, which is the K moduli. Now the remaining parts of the K moduli conjecture ask whether this is proper and projective, right? So um, so, so the third part of the theorem is going to say something about projectivity, assuming properness. Uh, so the statement is that every, every proper um, subspace, algebraic subspace of the K-moduli space, that, um, so right now they parameterize K-polystable final varieties, but the Yelty and Donaldson conjecture says that they should also have K-lines time matches because they are equivalent. So the statement is that every proper subspace that also parameterize, um, so the points are um, found of varieties with k Einstein matrix. Then this subspace is projected. So if you assume a little bit more about the points they parameterize, then you get projectivity. All right, so, so then, um, in terms of the k moduli conjecture, what's missing is that, so, so of course we expect this whole space to be projective. And also we expect that all the points they parameterize, which are k polystable, should also have k line stand matrix. So that's the mix, missing part. So, um, so now let me um, state our main theorem, um, which is um, joint work with uh, Yu Chen and Cheyang. So it has two parts. Um, so first one is that, uh, so the K-moduli space is actually proper. And second one, um, the Yalti and Donaldson conjecture holds uh, for any final variety. So in particular, as I just remarked, uh, putting these two together would imply the entire model, uh, k moduli conjecture. All right, so, so that's the thing. Uh, okay, uh, I know this is like a very long uh, statement. Are there any questions again? Uh, just to make sure I understand the KPS, the, the, it's like the connected components of the, KPS space are proper. There's still lots of. Uh, so, right. So, yeah. So, the connected components, of course. Yeah, great, great. Yeah. All right. So, um, so of course, um, so in this talk, I'm going to focus more on the um, properness of the K moduli space. Um, the Yalti Donaldson conjecture is a somewhat different story. All right. So, so from now on, let's restrict to that. Let me tell you more about the properness. And since from the beginning, I try to compare this with the moduli space of vector bundles, uh, maybe let's go back to this case of vector bundles and recall how we prove properness there. So, um, so for vector bundles, there are several ways to prove properness um, of the moduli space, but one of them is called Langton's algorithm. Actually, maybe I do have a question about that, the, the long, the, the, the the full theorem and, and how it fits together, which is there's this motivating, there are these, well, motivating and actual questions that are differential geometric in nature regarding Taylor Einstein metrics, but the definition is purely, uh, there's a purely algebra geometric question. And then the theorem mm -hmm. that you've written down, the one with many authors, one and two is purely algebraic. Three, you need to know what differential geometry is. And then in your theorem, one is purely algebraic geometry, and then two involves differential ge geometric output. Is that yeah? Right? So um, so right. So so for this part, uh, well, so um, let me put it this way. So um, so um, so here for simplicity, I can so you can replace everything by um, 
purely algebraic statement in every part. It's okay. just for simplicity, I use k line stand metric to okay. here. So, um, so there's there's some stronger stability condition that that is equivalent to k line stand metric, and that is known, which is okay. called um, reduced uniform stability. So the, the actual statement that you'll find in the paper that proved number three, so that was in my joint work with Chen Yang, is that so every problem model space that parameterized this reduced uniformly stable um, um, final variety status projective. Terrific, great, thanks. Yeah, I don't want to define that technical term. So that's why I put it this way. Right, yeah, but anyway, so thanks for the comments. Um, so, all right, so now let's come back to this Langton's algorithm. Um, so certainly if, if we are supposed to, so let me write down. So this for the modular space of vector bundles, say vector bundles over curve for simplicity. So in general, if you are supposed to prove uh, a modular space is proper, um, it's natural to start with the, use the evaluative criterion of properness. And in the case of vector bundles, you would, what you would do is the following. So we start with a curve um, and maybe with a distinguished point zero, and you take a family of vector bundles parameterized by, by the puncture curve. And so let's say this, this is a family of semi-stable vector bundles. And I would like to show that I can extend this family over the puncture to get a family of, again, of semi-stable vector bundles. So now, um, to start with, it's, it's a little bit harder to achieve this but it's relatively easy to write now a family um, of vector bundles, whatever stability they have. So this is only a vector bundle. Um, so I fill in the central fiber by some vector bundle. Now, um, if, um, if the central fiber is semi-stable, we are done. But if it's not, then Lenton has an algorithm to improve the stability. Um, so, so it, and it works as follows. If it's not semi-stable, then you can write down a maximal destabilizing subbundle. And of course that comes with a quotient. Um, so this F is the maximal destabilizing subbundle. Now, um, now, now Lenton says that, all right, so now if I replace this family, uh, if I take a family E prime, which is, um, so if, so, so if T, so if the total family is called curly E, so then, so this curly E maps to E zero maps to G. So if you take the kernel of that, uh, then this, this sub bundle suddenly become the quotient if you look at this new construction, right? So, so then if you look at the E prime zero, then uh, it has a subjective map to F and then the quotient becomes G. Sorry, the subbundle becomes G. So in some sense, by taking this Langton's construction, you are able to flip the maximal destabilizing subbundle to the quotient. And and this highly suggests to you that um, the stability is going to imp to to improve. Because what originally gave you a, a destabilizing object now is no longer there. So um so Langton actually so so there was Langton's work to show that um. So this algorithm actually works, so it improves stability um, throughout this process. And at some point it's going to stop. So if you repeat this process finally many times, replacing the subbundle, sorry, replacing the family of vector bundles by a new one, um, then eventually you are going to end up with a family of semi-stable vector bundles. So at the end, you get a semi-stable vector bundle. Right, so that was Langton's algorithm. So, um, so then for this rest of the talk, what I'm going to tell you um, would be, so what's the Langton's algorithm for the final varieties and what are the ingredients in there? So, so of course, to do this, I need to first tell you um, the definition of case stability because I haven't done that yet. Uh, we have to see how it looks like. Um, um, and then I need to first tell you, so, one key ingredient in this Clanton's algorithm is the existence of a maximal destabilizing subbundle. So then I need to tell you what's the maximal um, destabilizing object um, for final varieties. 
And finally, how do you adopt, um, um, adapt the latency algorithm in the final case um, to prove properness? Um, so for the modern stack of final varieties. All right, so that's my pick. Um, all right, so let me start from the definition of case stability. Um, so, uh, so the definition is going to take a little while to finish. So, um, so maybe I should first give you a summary of that. Uh, so what I'm going to really define is case semi-stability because that's what really matters to us for proving properness using this value tip criterion. So eventually we are going to show that if you have a family of case semi-stable final varieties over, over puncture curve, then you can fill in the central fiber using something that's again case semi-stable and that give you properness. Right, so I need to define this term. So, um, so roughly speaking, um, being case semi-stable says that um, an average divisor um, in the Q-linear system, so an average divisor that's Q-linearly equivalent to minus K has mild singularity. So it's, it has so-called log canonical singularity. But um, so that's the condition, right? So and of course I need to tell you what's log canonical and how do you measure the singularity of an average divisor like that, All right? So um, so let's see how far we can go. Um, so um, so the basic object in this definition um, are divide are prime divisors on various birational models of the variety. So I'm going to say E is a divisor over the final variety X. Um, if it's a prime divisor on some birational model. So why is a birational model? Meaning that this map pi is birational and proper, I guess. Um, all right, so, so this is a divisor um, over the final variety. Now associated with this divisor, I can attach a few invariants that are quite common in birational geometry. So the first invariant is the log discrepancy. And it's simply defined as one plus um, its um, its order, um, its multiplicity in the relative canonical divisor. So ky minus the pullback of k kx. So you can assume y is smooth, for instance. So this you recall the log discrepancy. Um, so um, so being log canonical, so if I have a divisor, um, an actual divisor on a variety, and a pair like this is theory called log canonical, um, if, um, if this log discrepancy function, uh, this log discrepancy is always greater than or equal um, to the multiplicity of this boundary divisor along E for, for any prime divisor over X. So in some sense, it's a measure of the singularity. You can imagine that this, this multiplicity is like the multiplicity of a point, um, but you are going to measure this multiplicity in various by choosing various different um, prime dividers on the covers. And this condition is roughly saying that this multiplicity is bounded from above by some measure of this multiplicity that you've chosen before. So, so that's the rough idea. So, but it's it's a condition on the singularity. That's that's the idea. All right. So, um, so then, um, in order to to make this sentence um reasonable, um, I just have to say, um, I just have to define what's the multiplicity of an average divisor. Um, so this multiplicity is called um the average expected vanishing order. Uh, Um, which is roughly um, the order of vanishing of an average divisor, whatever that means. Um, right, so, um, so um, before I tell you what's the meaning of this, uh, then I can at least state what um, the, the semi-stable condition. So being case semi-stable by definition says that this log discrepancy function 
is always greater than or equal to the expected vanishing order. So that's what I define to be the expect the vanishing order of an average divisor. Okay, so and this has to hold for every prime divisor over the final bracket. Okay, so um, so for this talk, actually, we don't really need the precise definition of this. Um, uh, so just to give you some flavor of what it looks like, we don't really need it. Um, but I don't want to give you too many black box either. Um, let me quickly write down the definition. So um, so first, what's an average divide? Um, so this has to be done at a finite level. Um, and what you get is so-called n basis type dividers. Um, so basically, um, you start with a sequence. Uh, sorry, you start with a basis um, of the pluricanonical sections, anti-canonical sections, um, and so you take the zero locus um, and average them. Right. So. So this is the averaging process. And as you average them, you get a divisor um, that's Killian and equivalent to minus MKX. Um, so you can further divide it, um, further rescale, um, so that it's actually Killian and equivalent to the anti-canonical divisor. So that's the averaging process. So every divisor of this form is what I consider to be an average divisor. Um, so now I want these dividers to be log canonical for any of them. And somehow so then, this, doesn't, this doesn't matter with your basis. You, you chose a basis. No, it, it matters. It matters. Okay. Um, right. So so then what I'm really defined as the, the vanishing order is the supremum. So uh, because I want all such average to be log canonical. Okay. So at the final level, I'm going to approximate my expected vanishing order using the supremum of um, the vanishing order of this average divisor. Um, by choosing you know, all possible combination of the basis. Okay, so this is any basis type divider, uh, n basis type. And then I take the limit as m goes to infinity. It turns out that the limit exists um, and, and that was shown by Bloom and Johnson using Arkonkov bodies. So, but at the end of the day, this is our expected vanishing order. Uh, as I said, uh, we don't really need this definition in this talk, but we have to keep in mind is that we have the lock discrepancy and we have a, a way to measure the expected vanishing order of an average divide. And being case semi-stable means that one is greater than or equal to the other. So it's a singularity condition. All right, uh, again, I know this is a long definition. Um, are there any questions so far? Maybe not a question, but I'm uh, in the case of the vector bundles. It's sort of the lack of stability told me. I feel like it, that condition, the the algorithm you said, it's kind of obvious what you want to try, and the magic is that the algorithm terminates. And here I'm, it, it's like a mystery story where I'm trying to guess what the algorithm is going to be, and now you've given some hints, and so now I'm curious to see. What yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep you guessing for for a little while, um, um, <laughs> but uh, but you'll see the answer at the end. Right, so, all right, so, okay, so I think, uh, let me, let me check my notes. Uh, right, so, um, so, so yeah, maybe at this point I should give you one example at least. Um, so, so maybe one example um, is that if you start with a toric final variety, then you would get an associated polytope. Um, Polytope associated to this ample line bundle, um, sorry, ample Q line bundle, the anti canonical. Then, um, so in this case, um, being case semi stable, if you track this, um, this, this condition against all the torus invariant divisors, it's going to tell you that the very center of this polytope is at the origin. So there is really some averaging divide process that you see intuitively here. Um, in fact, the, the converse is also true, but that's a little bit harder to prove. All right, so, so that's the example I want to give you. So in particular, if you remember all these weighted projective planes I mentioned to you at the beginning, only the P2 is case semi-stable. All the other ones are not. 
So by imposing this stability condition, it rule out the rest of them. So semi-stable, I usually think of as being a very kind of open, loose condition, whereas now this seems like a very closed, tight condition of it being at the... Uh, um, so the like, so yeah, it's an open condition, meaning that you know, if you degenerate, it's going to fail. Right. Yeah. But it's always on the boundary um, where, you, where it fails. All right, so, um, okay. So I think I need one more thing here. Um, right, so, um, so, so at the end of the day, we need to, I need to tell you this algorithm in some sense. I hope I still have time to do that. Um, so, um, but of course you want the stability to improve in this process. So that means we need a way to measure the stability. So, so this is the definition that give you um, the measurement. Um, and this is the so-called stability threshold. Uh, and given all the things that I have mentioned, the definition is very straightforward. So the stability threshold of a final variety is going to be defined as the infimum um, of um, the log discrepancy over the expected vanishing order as you vary the prime divisor on various variational models. So for people who have seen log canonical threshold, this is like a log canonical threshold, right? So, uh, but otherwise just take this as the definition. So in particular, um, a remark here is that, so being case semi-stable means that this invariant is at least one. Okay, so because being case semi-stable means that the nominator is always greater than or equal to the denominator. That's by definition. All right, so, um, so using this, I can at least tell you what's the, op the optimal destabilizing object we are going to use. Um, so, so at least from this definition, um, you might guess that, um, so since this invariant is a minimum, um, you know, this optimal destabilizing thing is something that computes it. And it has to be computed by some prime divisor that achieved the infimum. However, because we define this as an infimum, it's not clear from the beginning that such an infimum is a minimum. So actually that's a, a very subtle thing in the case of final varieties, because um, this optimal destabilization, the existence was only a regional conjecture. So um, optimal destabilization conjecture says that, um, um, so if my final variety X, is not k semi stable, then um, I can actually find some prime divisor on some directional model over x such that this threshold is computed um, by the log discrepancy over expected vanishing order for this prime divisor. So the infimum is the minimum. Now, um, assuming this exists, uh, which I'm going to tell you that it actually exists, uh, um, then it was shown um, by, um, so Alper, um, so this comes from the list of names that I wrote down earlier, um, Alper um, Bloom, Helper Neisner, uh, Liu Enxu, sorry, maybe uh, no Alper here. Um, um, so Bloom, Helper Neisner, Liu Enxu, and I think they, it's, it was based on another paper by Alper, um, Helper Einstein and Heinloth. Uh, that, um, so you can actually do this Langton's algorithm, assuming this conjecture, assuming the optimal destabilization can exist. Right? So what they show is that if this optimal destabilization conjecture holds, then um, this k moduli space is proper. So there are two things here. We need to verify that um, the optimal destabilization exists, which I'm to, going to um, leave until um, the very end. And the other thing is that um, the Langton's algorithm actually can be carried out. All right, so, um, so what's the idea um, here um, for, the, for the algorithm? So of course, for final varieties, you cannot do the things that, as we did for vector bundles. There is no kernels between final varieties, uh, um, but you can do something different. So here's the picture. Um, so, so let me first um, show the picture. So the base is our base curve. Uh, so let me first write down the framework. So, so in general, um, 
we start with the family um, of frontal varieties, um, okay, semi-stable frontal varieties. And we want to use the evaluative criteria properly and show that we can compute this family to a, um, a family over the complete kit curve C. Um, it's a little bit hard to do that at the beginning, but it's relatively easier to show that you can complete this to a family of final properties. So, so we forget the semi-stability condition for the, at the moment. Now I want to, again, find a, an algorithm to improve the stability, All right? So, um, so now in this picture, what I'm going to draw on the top um, is the locus in the suitable Hilbert scheme. Because if I want to complete a family of varieties, it's natural to you know, look inside the Hilbert scheme, take the limit. Well, so, um, so on the, over a generic point of my curve, um, um, I will have to write now, so basically the PGL orbit um, of the final variety there, um, inside the Hilbert scheme. And now I specialize this orbit um, to the puncture zero. And so what, I would what, like to see what I get. Great. You, what, what line bundle, which multiple of the canonical, of the anti-canonical are you? So I'm a little bit vague here. Um, mm -hmm. So you can try to increase this multiple, um, but at the end of the day, um, there, there will be a fixed multiple that right. one can consider. But, 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 just that, but, but, but a very big, it sounds like you're thinking like a very big. Like an, like yeah, it can very, be very, very, very big. big. Great. Yeah can be very big. Um, okay, so, but in any case, as you specialize this PGL orbit, it might break into several orbits, right? So, um, although um, I know one of the orbit um, would come from, at least if you choose a large multiple, it would come from the PGL orbit of the field in that I already chosen, right, for, for this family. So, of course, this one is not can semi-stable in general, but, um, um, there are several implications from the optimal destabilizing um, conjecture. So, um, so if um, if um, the stability threshold, so if it's not case semi-stable, and the stability threshold is computed by such a divisor, um, then it was shown by Bloom, Liu, and Joe uh, that. Uh, Then this divisor E is going to induce a degeneration. Um, of my final variety to something else. Um, so on the picture, um, what's going to happen is that you take the inside of this orbit, and this degeneration is to lead you to the boundary of this orbit. And what's particular about this degeneration is that um, the stability threshold doesn't change. Um, and on the other hand, it's also known um, by Bloom and Liu that, um, that the stability threshold is lower semi-continuous in family. So then basically the picture is that um, you start with the interior, something that's not um, stable. You find a degeneration going to the boundary, preserving the stability threshold. And then on the boundary, you have to deform to get to another component. But when you deform because of this semi-continuity, usually the stability threat, so it's going to increase. So now it increases, if it's still not um, semi-stable there, you find another optimal destabilization and get a degeneration, go to the boundary and deform. You continue this process and what they show in the paper is that eventually you are going to get something that's case semi-stable assuming each step you can find is such a degeneration. So maybe you should compare this um, to the case of vector bundles. So what you're really doing in the case of vector bundle is that you start with um, a, an unstable vector bundle. Um, you find this maximal destabilizing object. You degenerate it um, to the direct sum. And then you deform it in another direction to flip these two vectors. So that's the analogy here, right? So 
So in general, it's a degeneration plus deformation argument to improve stability. So there's now a lot buried here. Being, being able to degenerate now becomes non-obvious, completely non-obvious, unlike the yes, rest of the world. Yes. So, so what's, what's really different in the case of final case is that, um, so now we have the algorithm, but it's conditional on the existence of this, this, this de optimal destabilization, or which give you the degeneration. Right, so, um, so of course, uh, when I explain this, I haven't really- I mean, you, there's this degeneration that depends in some way on E. Maybe I missed what you said, but how does yeah. E give you a degeneration? Right, so I haven't, I haven't told you yet. So that's oh. what I'm going to say next. Right, so, so now let's go back and see um, how this degeneration is obtained. At least what's the central factor? So, um, so this degeneration, as um, Richard mentioned, it depends on this, um, this divisor. And usually this, this E is not unique. Um, but it always give you a degeneration like this. That's the upshot. All right, so, so what's this degeneration? Um, so, um, but maybe, maybe, maybe let me first mention something else. Um, so at least um, assuming um, what I just said, the remaining thing we need to figure out uh, uh, is this optimal destabilization conjecture, right? So, um, and there is a naive approach to this. Um, before I get into the family of the, the degeneration. Um, so of course, um, so this conjecture says that I want to find some divisor that computes delta invariant. Um, so of course you can always start with a sequence that, that computes the infimum and try to find a way to take their limit. Um, but if you just take their limit on just various parasitical models, you run into a problem because these models can, can go up higher and higher, you never stop. You can continue blowing up. So instead, um, the right place um, to take the limit um, is in the space of valuations. So non -un some non-Archimedean objects. Um, so of course, every divisor over the variety is to, going to give us a discrete valuation of the function field. And in order to take their limit, we need to rescale them. So in general, uh, what we really consider are the space of real valuations. So it turns out there's a um, log discrepancy function and um, the expected vanishing order, they both extend um, to the space of valuations. Um, so real valuations, meaning that we can take real values so um, it was already shown um, by Bloom and Johnson that um, so although we don't know the optimal destabilization conjecture, we do know that this threshold is always computed by some valuation for some real some, valuation. Some crazy, right, real, okay, some crazy valuation. So it can be very crazy. So maybe, you know, X has value one, Y has value pi, um, something like that. Um, right, so, so then um, now let's go back. So how do we play around with this? So now let's go back um, to this construction of the degeneration. So um, if, if this valuation is divisorial, meaning that it's actually comes from a prime divisor and the vanishing order along that prime divisor. Here is how we write down the degeneration, at least the central fiber. So this, this value, valuation is going to introduce to us um, a filtration on the anti-canonical section ring. Uh, so, so basically this is, uh, it, it's going to come from a risk construction, if you know what that means. So for that, I need a filtration. So let me just write this down first. Um, so this filtration is, uh, so the filter pieces um, are just the sections of this anti pluri canonical line bundle whose value along this valuation is at least lambda. Right? So those are the filters of spaces. And, and then the central fiber of this degeneration is, um, so the approach 
of, um, so you take the direct sum of all the graded pieces of this filtration. Uh, F V and lambda. So um so that's that's the degeneration. Um, um and that was if that's if it's so if you consider like so each each so this are basically the space um on the total space that you know um if you put this um C star action with different weights on different space and degenerate then on the central fiber you would get this. Um, that's the direct sum. All right. So um so when V comes from the divisor, this is what you get. And of course, you can do this without assuming this divisorial condition. So for arbitrary evaluation, you get a filtration. You write down this algebra, take the approach. The only caveat is that um, if you want to get an algebraic variety at the end, you need this algebra to be finitely generated. And that's the big question. So, um, so when the valuation is divisorial, this was a consequence of the paper by Berka, Kashini, Haken, McKernan. But if the variation becomes crazy, then it's more mysterious. Um, so this was, this was originally um, the content of the so-called higher rank finite generation conjecture in rational geometry, where higher rank means that the variation has rational rank higher than one. Um, so that was actually what we um, proved um, as a main technical result in our paper. Um, and so in the joint work with Wei Chen and Chiang. So what we show is that um, if, um, if the final variety is not case semi-stable and the stability threshold is computed um, by evaluation. So, so, so not case semi, so in particular, this is less than or equal to one. Um, so for some valuation V, um, maybe I should give a name to this algebra. So, uh, so let me call this uh, the graded ring associated um, to, to this valuation. Um, so we sometimes put an R on the right-hand side, um, the graded ring associated to the valuation. Um, so then the conclusion of the theorem is that, um, so this graded ring is always finitely generated. This is not so. This gives you a construction for the degeneration in general. So, um, but of course, uh, so at the end, this is also going to imply the optimal destabilizing conjecture um, when when this is less than one, and uh, and in the case uh, when this is equal to one, this implies the Yau Chen Donaldson conjecture. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to say anything about this. So. All right. So yeah. So that's the main technical statement, and I think I have to stop here. Yes, uh, I'm running out of time. Great. Um, thanks for attention. Fantastic. We can all meet ourselves and thank Zutron for, for a fantastic talk.